Hi, this is Yvonne Galusha, and I'm going to be talking about information security today. Uh, we don't have a session ID. Just a reminder, the project is due a week from this Friday, April 27th, and I'm holding extra office hours this Friday, and it's from 11 a.m. to 12.30. If you would like to stop in, note our final exam is on Tuesday at 7.30 a.m. I've been saying that. Those of you who have a conflict, you will need to sign up at the podium for the makeup exam, which is a Monday at 3 p.m. So last time we talked about the threats, and this time we're going to focus on what is the response to all these threats. Let me set the stage a little further and say that we've had an alarming increase in security issues as far as cybercrime and general threats in terms of disruption in the last decade. And the trends that have supported this primarily is the expanse in network capability, especially through cell phones and into third world countries. And then also just the amount of things that are now being done with systems. As the networks increased, people took advantage of it by offering new applications. And therefore, we've become more and more dependent and the criminals are figuring out ways to conduct crime using the networks. So the trade-off, as there is an increase in security and control, that tends to impact our privacy. We talked about that already at length with the Patriot Act and the espionage that the U.S. government now conducts in order to maintain what they think is necessary for the national security. So it's a big challenge. In general, Let's be sure we're really clear that information security is broader than just protecting against criminals. And you, you want to think of it in a broad way. The general term or acronym is they call it the CIA triad, which I've got that on the next slide. But right here, I just want to point out C stands for confidentiality, I integrity, and A availability. So you'll notice. It's not just keeping unauthorized people gaining access. It's also ensuring that the data is available in a timely, accurate way, and those who are authorized are the ones who get access to it. So it's, it's a very, very big challenge. So this is where that CIA triad comes in. And people who work in this arena of security. There's typically a chief information officer in large organizations and they have a security specialist that report directly to them because it's a big ongoing job with many, many people involved ensuring the CIA triad. So the other part that makes this really complex is typically we think you've got to ensure integrity during the processing stage, but it's broader than that. They have to ensure that integrity, availability, where the data is actually stored, and then also while it's being transmitted. So these are many, many layers of ways that have to be defended. So people who work in this arena, they basically maintain an entire security program. It's accomplished at, in many, many different ways, and everybody in the organization needs to support it if you are going to have robust security. So trying to establish a security program requires that you first analyze your assets and threats. And so this is the first thing you're doing is you're looking carefully at your networks and your servers and figuring out exactly what are the threats. Then you have to educate users in terms of your policies to hopefully prevent any security incident. So intrusion is basically thought of as an incident. And then what are you going to do if an incident occurs? So the, these are the typical steps. You're going to have to notify people and then make sure you somehow have evidence that this did occur. A lot of times you're looking at log files. You contain it, eradicate it, meaning remove, 
and then you have recovery phase. Let's look, drill down a little more on the risk assessment. So as I said before, you have to do a thorough risk assessment of all of your assets. So individually, you identify your assets, specify them, and then you look at the individual threats, risks, potentially that could occur on each one. And remember, you're having to look at processing data where it's stored, as well as any communication of data. Then you have to look at the likelihood of a particular threat that you've listed for that asset. Then you want to look at the impact that that threat could have. How large of a potential threat is it, basically, you're trying to determine. Therefore, once you understand that, then you can start considering how could we mitigate that, meaning try to keep that from happening, that particular threat on that particular asset. In essence, you come up with a feasibility for mitigating it. Sometimes it's so expensive to try to mitigate it that you realize you just are going to have to continually check to see if that happens or not because you can't afford from a cost-benefit point of view to totally prevent it. And that's where that decision then comes in. What threats on what assets are you going to spend the money and try to prevent and the others monitor. So in essence, you get this kind of onion security model. You, you see here in the center the CIA triad and then of course your hardware, software where you're looking at processing as well as storing and then the communications is where data is being moved between assets and between people. That's all going on at the middle and you end up then with various products having certain policies and protocols that you've established that the people need to follow and they're all documented as procedures. In essence these are referred to as security controls and some of them will be automated in how you configure your systems and others are manual that your workers need to uphold. And these kind of security controls take three different forms. You're going to have some that are more preventative in nature, meaning you're trying to stop or limit a particular threat. So an example of that would be like antivirus software. And by the way, we all should be running that on our systems. There are good free products, so be sure you do install an antivirus product and then be sure you update it regularly, meaning you don't have to update the software, but you need to be sure the update file gets installed in terms of new threats because there are thousands of new malware every second being released in today's world. The second type of control would be corrective. So this is where an incident has occurred and now you need to repair the damages. A lot of antivirus software will do this for you if you run a regular check and it will quarantine, meaning separate out the problem and notify you of additional steps you may need to take. And then finally, detective controls are where you are continually looking at things like log files so you can detect has something happened. Remember we talked about last time rootkits getting installed and so if you're looking at your audit files you should be able to detect and wanted intruders. So in essence, these that I'm going to talk about next are strategies and they are reflected in the policies that you establish. Layering, diversity, limiting, obscurity, and simplicity. Be sure as you prepare for the final exam that you understand the distinction in each of these. I will ask questions where you will choose which one makes sense. Now the first one, layered security, that's simply that onion model. It's the idea that even if you're in a military situation, you have layers of defense so that if the enemy penetrates one layer, they have to work through another layer. Diversity strategy is related to that, except now you're saying, in addition to having these layers of defense, you're also making sure that to get through one layer is different 
because you don't want the enemy to figure out how to get through one layer and of course just repeat it to get through all the layers. So you need to be sure you have different techniques involved in the way you're setting up these layers of defense. Limiting access has to do with establishing roles. You recall the example I mentioned last time where when you as a student log in to the university with your Hawk ID credentials, you have access to certain resources because your role is student. Whereas when I log in, my role would be faculty and I have access to additional resources. So the principle in limiting access strategy is that you establish these roles in your login accounts so that when a person logs in, they only have access to the resources in the organization that they need to do their job. Now, the obscurity strategy, this is where you set up a firewall in the organization. This is just to remember, remind you, firewalls are established with routers. You configure them so that you keep certain packets outside and other packets inside your organization. And so the idea is that you configure your network such that you hide what is going on. And also part of the obscurity strategy is you want to avoid clear patterns of behavior. I'll just remind you of something we can all relate to. And that is it used to be they would have money cars that would, they were more like kind of armored vehicles and they would move money around, literally large amounts of cash. Well, we don't have quite as much cash in circulation with the electronic transactions, but I'm sure they still exist. The point is, is people who are criminals, they monitor and they see when these vehicles would regularly pick up at what locations. That's the same idea. You don't want to do certain things like always do your backups and maybe mail them out at a certain time every week to get them off site. If somebody wanted to steal certain backup information, they would notice this behavior. So you try to obscure what you're doing in your organization. Now the simplicity strategy is kind of the converse side of that obscurity that I just spoke about. Because if you make your policy so complex that people who are doing their daily job can't remember all the steps, then they tend to mess up or they just simply decide not to do all the steps. So it's a balance. You need to keep them simple enough on the inside that people will follow them, but they are obscure from the outside. So the bottom line is people who are in charge of security in the organization need to create the security program and it basically documents all the security policies in a, in a living document, meaning it changes. It's, it's not just put on the shelf and brush the dust off. It needs to be followed every day. And it defines all these requirements that are need to be upheld to ensure the security. So there's a lot of controls. And then you need to be sure that the rules are being followed. And it, this includes mobile devices. So it's a big, big challenge for people who are responsible for security in organizations. The implementation ends up being including all these steps. You have to, of course, educate your employees once the policies, the security program is in place. And then you have to, as I said, assess. You have to be sure preventative measures like firewall are in place. A lot of times you will have um, special applications that have been written, like that include a dashboard, a lot of visual windows so that people who are continually monitoring security can see the status, make sure everybody's running antivirus software, and again, make sure the file, meaning the malware file, is updated regularly. Then you normally have credentialing policies, meaning Passwords have to be meet certain requirements and that they need to be changed every so often. Roles are established to limit access. And then you have to obviously stay abreast of new 
very serious malwares. They usually are reported by some of these organizations, so you can especially be sure you're defending against those. And then audits. I want to point out that an audit is not the same thing as system monitoring. Those two phrases may sound similar, so catch the difference. An audit is going to be when you're checking, are your policies being followed? Whereas system monitoring is going to be where you're looking at packets with this IDS, special software, and sometimes there are even hardware devices that are continually monitoring the packet traffic. And then, of course, it, that will include monitoring who's logged in and how long they're logged in on your networks. Now, if you do have an incidence, then you've got to be sure you've got procedures for containment, removal, and then recovery, and then, of course, additional prevention so that you can ensure this doesn't happen again, that particular incident. All right, the next thing I'm going to talk about are these three A's. And these, again, are things that security specialists really pay attention to. And so the three A's, authentication, which we're going to spend more time on the next few slides, and that's basically making sure the person requesting access to resources are who they say they are. Access control, that is basically how you implement that limiting strategy, meaning making sure people have only access to resources they need to do, to do their job. And then finally, the auditing, which sometimes is referred to as accounting in this area of security. But remember, that's where you're tracking users and their actions and being sure policies are followed. So authentication is where I want to spend more time. So authentication includes presenting information that can be used to verify you are who you say you are. We traditionally present a login and a password, but that's not the only thing. Sometimes, especially when you have systems authenticating to the, each other, when you have these low-level electronic transactions, tokens are used, and also digital certificates. Now, I'm going to speak a little more about those later, but let's focus more on the user side first. So the authentication process is first identification, and that's basically taking your credentials in whatever form, most of the time typing them in. Then the system does the authentication. They look at the database to see if those credentials are correct. Then authorization. That is where you actually allow somebody to complete a login. And during that authorization process, you then grant access to the resources that they are allotted according to their role. However, authentication credentials really can be more than just a username and password. And the way you think about authentication are these four questions or statements I have in red. First, what you know. Now, this can be more than just your password. Password's the most common, but as you, I'm sure, have been exposed, there are security questions that when you want to authenticate to a web application, they want you to provide answers so that later on they may ask you additional security questions. So those are all under the umbrella of what you know. However, it can be what you have as well like say an ATM machine. You have to enter your PIN what you know, but it's also you have to literally have that card in order to gain access to funds. Now in the area of biometric, it's also who you are. Notice that this is based on physical characteristics. Okay, it's, it's, it's not what you know or what it is sort of what you have, but it's more spe specifically who you are. And again, this is basically biometrics. And then last, where you are. They used to do this where they would restrict logins according to certain ranges of IP addresses. But today that's rarely used because it's pretty easy to spoof an IP address. In fact, that's how the dark web works. So 
that's no longer considered a very secure method of authentication. I want to talk about passwords because passwords in some ways are deceiving in that they lead people to think if you have a good password and you change it often that somehow that is secure and that's really a false way of thinking today. Passwords are very easily broken. Anything you can memorize as a person can be broken. I'm talking about even a 50 um, character password. There are computers that people buy. One of the more well-known is Brutalis, and it's, it's not an unreasonable cost, you know, a few thousand dollars. It, it specializes in breaking passwords. It just takes a matter of seconds to break any password that somebody can memorize. So how do we deal with this? Most people don't realize it, but today you really should use a password manager. And KeePass is one that's free. Um, CNET highly recommended that in 2017, so I would suggest you investigate that. You can basically, the way KeePass works is you install this on whatever device you're going to need to be logging in. So if you have a phone, a laptop, a tablet, you would install KeePass app on all of them. You create a database file, and in that database file, you enter your credentials for the various places you log in, say, for example, your bank account, your email, your Gmail, anything else. And then you basically have to move that database file to all your devices. You do not want to store that database file on the cloud. That defeats the whole purpose. The criminals are smart enough to go get that database file if they can get access to your cloud storage. So instead, you want to manually move it to your various devices. And KeePass is very, very intelligent. So you can let it auto-generate passwords for you that are very, very complex. They are long, and they include characters that you can't even type on the keyboard. And so then the obvious question is, how do you know that password? Well, you don't type it in. What happens is if you want to get to something, you open KeePass and open that database file that you saved. And then it's a database, but it's a particular type of extension which is associated with the KeePass application. Make sure I'm clear on that. Anyway, so once you say you're logging into your bank account, you open KeePass and you click things in KeePass and part of when you set up a database entry, it includes the URL to that account as well as your credentials and it will automatically enter everything and log you in. So you see, this defeats the uh, criminals in terms of breaking your passwords. A little more on biometrics. Um, the one place at the university where you may have noticed that I've noticed they ha are using it, and that's in the uh, club member locker rooms in the uh, workout lab. People have hand geometry recognition to enter the locker rooms in addition to what they know. Other types of biometric, of course, are fingerprints or retinal scan, iris scan, etc. So notice, all of these have to do with your physical characteristics, and they are used in addition to what you know. So username and password, it's still there, but that's not a very secure. It can be intercepted. It's not encrypted during the communication, and even if it is grabbed, if they get your login, they can easily use Brutalis to figure out your password. Then single sign-on authentication. This is the idea that you sign on to like a work environment or Tippy, some local area network. And once you're signed on, you don't have to keep signing on because it keeps track of your authentication and that it gives you a certain period as long as you keep working before you'll time out. Notice this term, mutual authentication. This is when you have a third party involved in this authentication process. And when we get to encryption, I'm going to talk more about this. Certificates. This is used also in encryption. 
and certificates in essence are also referred to as keys and they are used in that authentication process. So we'll talk more about both of these. Other things used in authentication, tokens. So I told you we'd come back to that. Basically, an example of a token is where you forgot your password on a website. So you say, click forgot password, and then they email you, as long as you can answer the security question, a link so that you can have like a chance to uh, enter a new password. So there's a special token exchange that's taking place that says, okay, bypass our normal security. And so that's helping you understand. Tokens are used at the, in other ways at the low level. But my point is helping you to understand that sometimes additional things beyond what we've talked about, like tokens, are needed. So one-time passwords, that is a form of a token, which I actually just described. Again, you would get this where somebody, some systems will just generate a link that will give you a one-time password, but then you have to immediately change it once you're connected. Now, smart cards are actually the more the wave of the future. And this is where... I have a video on it. I don't know if I'll take time to show it, but let me just talk about it. Smart cards are where you can purchase them for a few hundred dollars, and you basically use them in conjunction with an app on your mobile device, and you make copies of all your cards, like your debit cards for your banks, your credit cards, or other access cards for like your points for grocery shopping. And you get it all on that single card. And so then there are buttons on the front of the smart card that allow you to select which card you want to use. So the benefits of this is that you only have to worry about one card. Plus, since it works in conjunction with the app, receipts are all electronically captured, which can be very convenient, especially people who travel and need to allocate receipts and turn them in for expense reports. And with a smart card, if you are to, if you lose it, you can basically destroy the contents so nobody else can use it. So there's a lot more technology and things involved with smart cards, and this is more the way of the future, the way things are moving. Session keys happen at the low level. So think about what happens when you are on an e-commerce site like Amazon and you're in the middle of going through browsing their products and you're putting some things in the cart. What's happening is you basically create a session when you start that process and Amazon is not asking you to continually re-authenticate because it's keeping track that this is your session. If you stop and don't continue with a purchase, after a while, they'll close the session if it remains inactive. So session keys will get generated after you're authenticated, like say like in a banking situation, so that you aren't continually having to re-enter information. And it's keeping track who you are and you belong to this session. And think about a web server. They're dealing with lots of different requests from many, many different people. So they need a way to keep track of the communications coming to them. And that is all accomplished with session keys. Notice this word, M multi-factor. This sometimes people get confused with mutual authentication. These are two completely different things. Mutual authentication involves a third party, whereas multi-factor authentication is simply saying you are using multiple methods to authenticate, and this is considered much stronger. So multi-factor would be what you have with an ATM card, a debit card at an ATM machine, and what you know with the PIN. Or as I said a minute ago, to get into the club locker room. It's 
who you are with your handprint biometric and what you know with the number you have to enter to gain access to the club locker room. So multi-factor, be sure you know that's not the same thing as mutual authentication. Here I'm just showing you an image about the single sign-on. Um, basically this happens within a local area network. You have some type of domain controller that's keeping track of you've logged in and now that I want to print you don't have to log in again or every time you want to get access to your H drive you don't have to re-log in to gain access it's keeping track through the domain controller and it's referred to as a single sign-on authentication here's some more information on smart cards and smart cards are automatically multi-factor because it's what you have in the card itself and what you know because there is additional whether you call it a pin or number password that every time you use it there's those two steps are involved okay now we are going to talk about the more complex part in this lecture and that's cryptography cryptography is the general field or term that's used to describe this field of encryption. And the purpose of cryptography first was to basically try to hide information as it was being transferred or communicated. And so they would scramble it. And that's basically known as encryption. And encryption is a process of encoding by a specific computer algorithm. Now, if you have a particular algorithm and you're submitting a string of text that you want encrypted to it, if you don't have another piece, the algorithm is always going to behave the same every time. Therefore, the criminals can figure out the algorithm and that means the encryption is not very secure. So people in this field of cryptography realize this and they realized we have to have another piece that goes in. When we want to encrypt something in the algorithm, we need to have, it's referred to as a SALT from a technical point of view, but the SALT is referred to as a key or certificate. And so that causes the algorithm to behave differently, so it's much, much more difficult for criminals to figure figure it out and decrypt messages. So here's just an example. Be sure you understand what I mean by scramble. These are just very simple. One algorithm could be based on transposition, which you're basically taking the plain text, the word software, and if it's encrypted using transposition, you change the arrangement of the letters. And so this is referred to as ciphertext because it's encrypted now. If it's not encrypted, it's referred to as plain text. Another algorithm could be substitution. So now you have the exact same amount, but an I is a W instead, an N is an L instead. So each letter is replaced with another. Or you could have expansion where you insert extra things in a certain way, or compaction and you remove certain things. So all of these are just methods of accomplishing ciphertext. And algorithms, of course, are much more sophisticated than any one single method in order to get something that looks very scrambled from the plain text. So how is this actually implemented? When they first started doing this on a larger scale, they created what was known as private key encryption, also known as symmetric encryption. The reason the word symmetric was chosen is because you use the same key to both encrypt and decrypt. So in essence, you put the plain text into the algorithm along with the key and ended up with ciphertext. 
and then to get the plain text back, you put the ciphertext into the algorithm program along with the same key and the decrypting produced plain text. The problem was, how do you share the key? You had to send it along with the ciphertext. Well, the criminals realized that, and so they would sniff, meaning pull off the information while it was being transferred, communicated, and then they would just figure out by using the key, and they had the uh, ciphertext, they'd eventually figure out how to decrypt it. So obviously this was not very good. They could break the code. The issue was they could not easily incorporate private key encryption because you had to pass the key around. So their second attempt, think of it as perhaps a second generation, was to come up with public key encryption. This is referred to as asymmetric encryption because there are two different keys, meaning you have a key pair. So, in essence, you could encrypt with key one, and then you decrypt with key two. And they worked in the other direction as well. You could also encrypt with key two, and then decrypt with key one. So the pairs of keys always work together in asymmetric encryption. This is referred to as public key encryption because those people who use this, they keep one key private or secret, then they keep the other key public, meaning it's on the server. So it's public. Anyone can go and pick up your public key. So how does this work? So let's say John wants to send a secure message to Jane. He uses Jane's public key. He gets it off the server, uses Jane's public key when he goes and puts his plain text in the algorithm, and it comes out ciphertext. He does not have to send the key to Jane. He simply sends the ciphertext. Jane then uses her private key that nobody knows but Jane. She enters it into the algorithm program along with the ciphertext and therefore it's decrypted. And only Jane can do it because the only way that that can be decrypted is with the private key, which remember, only Jane should have. This is how business is conducted today, is PKI, public key encryption. It's very strong. It's considered non-reputable, meaning in legal situations, transactions around the world are conducted this way, and repudiation is the idea that you can deny this happening, but it's considered non-reputable because of this PKI infrastructure that I'm going to talk about next. And keep in mind, it's happening in many different ways. I'm giving you examples with people because I think that helps you relate to it and understand it. But this sort of thing is happening at, down in between machines and networks as well. So let me talk about digital signatures. Please, please, please catch this point. On the final exam, if you see the term digital signature, I am not talking about a picture of your signature. That is not what I mean at all. A digital signature is accomplished with this PKI infrastructure. This is how it works. Let's say John agrees to a foreign contract that has been emailed to him. What John does in order to create a digital signature is he takes the contract and he runs it through as plain text through the encryption algorithm along with his private key. 
that creates the ciphertext, which is referred to as a message digest or hash. Basically, this, it's like a little file of ciphertext, is referred to as John's digital signature of that contract. It's a ciphertext generated with his private key. So what happens is when the people get this from him, because he then emails that hash along with the original document back to his foreign contract contact, they then get from the server and get John's public key, and they put the public key into this algorithm along with the ciphertext message hash or message digest or it's sometimes called just a hash and that decrypts it and they can see it's the original contract they sent him therefore they know that john had to do this because he could he's the only one that could have encrypted it that way with his private key which he's supposed to keep secret Therefore, that is his digital signature. It verifies his identity, that he was the person who did this. And this holds up in court as being non-repudiable because he's responsible for his keys. So you can't later say, I didn't sign that contract if you created that hash and emailed it back to the other person. So the obvious question is, where do these keys come from? And now we're going to tie back to what I said a minute ago on certificates. Basically, PKI is based on mutual authentication, meaning there is a third party involved. And these, this third party is referred to as a certificate authority. And they are the ones that issue the keys. VeriSign is the leading certificate authority, at least in this country. Let me show you this. This is kind of how it works. So you as an individual want to get some keys. So you, in essence, have to submit identifying information and it's, it costs you some money, and you have to pay an annual fee to keep them current. But basically, they go through a process, just like you were trying to get a loan from a bank, and they verify you are who you, you say you are. And they either approve it or they don't. If it's approved, they issue these certificates. These are like files that you have on computers. They're just specialized type files. One is private you keep, the other one is kept public on the server. Now, if you go to make certain transactions, you in essence are providing keys, meaning that that can be verified you are who you say you are. That's one way that these are used in terms of low level between machines. So there then is a process where they'll request information and it, they verify it and then they go ahead and proceed and you're able to accomplish the transaction in this sense. But keep in mind it can be used in just encrypting as the examples I've already said as well. So there are various types of certificates. You can have certificates that are used as corporations and that helps people know when they're doing business. They'll go through the certificate authority and get electronic verification. This, this is a legitimate business. You will get certificates for servers. So behind the scenes, you will have web servers verifying with the certificate authority, this is the legitimate web server. And that's becoming more common to help address the spoofing problem. And so you will get a warning on your client computer if you're trying to make an e-commerce purchase and you'll, it'll say something like, this is not the valid web server. That's becoming more common. Personal certificates. That's where people want to do their own encryption, as I've already talked about. Or software certificates. 
for a particular release of Windows or a particular application. Maybe you've tried to download and install something on your computer and you get a dialog box that says that they can't validate the certificate. Well, that's why. It's going through this certificate authority and it's basically saying this is not a valid certificate. In which case, you better think twice before installing. So on the final thing I'll say about security here and encryption, <coughs> excuse me, and we've talked about this before, and this is where you want to be sure anytime you're entering information like credit cards, information numbers, that it's being encrypted behind the scenes. So HTTPS is an enhancement to the HTTP protocol that encryption is taking place. And that's done at a secure socket layer, transport layer. It's not that you do anything, but that particular protocol is doing it at the low level. So it's being scrambled before it's sent to and from, for example, the e-commerce server. So you should always look at the URL if you're on an e-commerce site or a bank login site and be sure that they are using encryption because if they are not the criminals know that those sites are not being encrypted so it's very very easy for them to pick up sniff it's called on those kind of transactions and pick up plain text so shifting gears in terms of other kind of defenses large organizations will purchase special IDS intrusion detection software for the purpose of monitoring remember this word monitoring not auditing systems so they monitor and be sure network traffic is what it's supposed to be so that they can identify if there's been an intrusion and then sometimes they will also set up a honeypot and honeypots are where they try to attract the criminals they set up a machine and they intentionally do not make it very secure so that when the criminals break into it they can then analyze it and see what they did and how they broke in and learn from it so they can better defend their other servers now computer forensics is a field that's kind of related to all this people who go into that are very very technically competent in analyzing systems and they basically help solve crimes. There's been TV shows where they kind of make a big deal out of this and it's kind of interesting job, but you have to really understand security and systems to go into these kind of jobs because you can see then because of the security things that are in place, how systems have been tampered with or you can basically analyze systems to get it necessary information. So on this lecture, I have some additional information, mostly for you to have in review, because I know that there's a lot here. And I will tell you that on the final exam, people tend to score a little lower on this area of technology because there's just so much detail. So I've added some slides here to help you be able to look at and review and be sure you understand all these terms so when you read them on the final exam you know what the questions are asking and I've also summarized some of the key points as well to help you in your review some of this is from the first lecture on security and I hope this will be beneficial for you as you prepare for the final exam thank you <laughs>